Kia ora, good evening. Those looking to have their say on the first stage of the inner city redevelopment are more than welcome to as the City Council set up shop in the Cambridge Arcade. For the next four days, the new concept plans will be on display with Council staff on hand to take public feedback. Urban designer Craig Pocock took Hunter Andrews through the Esk Street concept, starting with his first impression of Esk Street three years ago. What jumped out at me initially is that it lacked amenity, so there wasn't many places to sit or, or to, to gather or to uh, shelter. So, um, so that was my initial thoughts. It wasn't until we did the consultation that we get a much clearer idea about how we might deal with this street. You have high quality materials, um, you've still got your historical buildings that give you a great backdrop, um, you've got a lot of really good retail shops that are in main streets that have been lost elsewhere. So you've got a lot of good aspects. Um, really, I suppose what struck me in the end is that a lot of stuff just wasn't particularly well connected and if we could make it just a little bit more user friendly we could that was probably the the, the best um, values we could bring. What were your thoughts on the one way of East Street? Do you think it uh, one way is a good idea? Yeah I do. With East Street I do think it, it makes sense. What the one way does is it gives you, it maximises your car park but it also maximises your public amenity on the south side of the street. So you've got six metres of open space on the south side which is the sunny side uh, where your cafe is currently set up, um, where you've got some street trees and some public art. And so if it was two ways you would lose that, that wider band that's really now currently given to the pedestrians. So I think one way for ESC is good. Let's talk about the weather. That's a major factor in any sort of upgrade in Invercargill. We all uh, like to get from shelter to shelter. A lot of people see just cover East Street. That's obviously not practical. What has been done here? Let's have a wee look at the plan sure. here. What, what, what is uh, there for shelter? Sure. I think weather is probably one of those things I might have underestimated when I go there. And I think unless you've lived here, do you fully understand uh, you know, the, what it's like? Um, so, you know, in and out of here for three years, I feel like I'm starting to understand, only just starting maybe, to understand how the weather works. Um, over the last week we spent a fair amount of time looking at how the weather um, works on the street and where it bounces and you know the main wind coming through on the diagonal we end up having this end of the street still pretty exposed to the weather and then as everybody will know uh, from the Southland Times and, and the weather bouncing off the Kelvin Hotel and hitting the north face of the street through here is you know the other area that's, that's quite unpleasant. Um, what we have looked at doing is creating a series of shelters so Image-wise, you can see here uh, the pocket park that's in the centre of the street, uh, having shelters above it, um, but glazed so you can still get that maximum light onto the ground. And what that happens is as the wind, or how that works I should say, is the wind that comes over the building, if any wind does come over, it bounces off the roof and continues on. So we believe that we can create a complete wind shadow here where the wind doesn't hit the, hit the street at all. And so that wind shadow, obviously, we can see from the uh, diagram there, or the plan there, that, 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 are, that is naturally seating, little seating areas along East Street as well. That's right. So you've got the best sun coming in this way, you've got the wind coming in over the top, and the, this is all, you know, in the wind shadow it gets full sun, and so then this is the best place to occupy. And so we've, we've retained all the width right through here, um, but just created areas of planting, and raise planters so that at least you can occupy these spaces with your back to the traffic without feeling like you're, you're in a space with vehicles coming at you. And interesting, when we first came in here, you were in Councillor Sycamore, we were looking at things like paving. What difference does the use of paving make? You mentioned something about reflecting light, reflecting heat perhaps. Yeah, um, paving wise, I suppose it does a lot of different things. Apart from, you know, quality of paving says this is a quality environment, which is always good, right signal. Um, secondly is where you change a significant change in the paving tells the vehicles that as they come along they're now heading into a pedestrian zone that, that they should be looking out for pedestrians crossing the street so at this point it doesn't read like the rest of the street and that's an important signal to make the, the vehicle slow much uh, slow down considerably through here um, and then the other thing that we're sort of playing with is if we have some bands of lighter paving, whether we can bounce light off it. So at night, instead of just having the vertical lights and poles and street lights, whether we have lighting on the ground that uh, bounces off the paving. But these are the things that we're working on now. I think he's done a fantastic job so far. Um, and the seating that he's provided today as a sample is uh, quite a comfortable sort of a street seat, if you like. But then again, I'm just one uh, voice, so what we need to happen now is for as many people as possible to get in here right up till uh, Friday this week, and the shop's open every day, 9 o'clock in the morning till 5 at night, or the late night Wednesday, 5 to 7, so if anybody 
who's tied up during the day, uh, come along Wednesday night and have a look and give us your opinion on what you think. I think the key thing for us anyway is that weather, isn't it, and keeping the people sheltered on East Street. Some people have said cover East Street, which is uh, an unimaginable scheme really, but um, it looks interesting what he's proposing. It is. Look, the key in Invercargill is shelter, and uh, all of us locals know that even on a nice sunny day in the middle of summer, it can be spoiled by that bitterly cold southwester that lingers around all day, and uh, it's not inducive towards sitting and enjoying. So with the shelter that Craig's proposing around the little seating areas, it'll just cut out that uh, unpleasant wind and uh, make it a, a nice... Uh, place just to sit for a while and uh, have a chat. And those four four days that people can come and have a look, you're welcoming their input as well, aren't you? Council staff will be here to hear what they've got to say. Yes, they will. Well, it'll be manned all the time by staff and with a bit of help by SIT students as well. And we'll have some uh, questionnaire forms with some possible comments on and uh, a place for you to write down whatever you think. Because the more uh, feedback we get, then uh, the better idea we have of what needs to be changed. Because what we're proposing at the moment is, is exactly what we're planning to do, but if it's, uh, for whatever reason, is found uh, to be immensely unpopular or little bits can be changed, uh, we'll look at uh, trying to please as many as we can. Stay with us after the break. James Hargest College Senior Campus rises from the ashes plus chamber music and taekwondo. Welcome back. Almost 18 months on and a block of classrooms that were destroyed by fire in an arson attack have finally been officially reopened. Ex-head boy Carlos Bagri and Master Chef Nadia Lim did the official honours at James Hargist College Senior Campus this morning. The fire put six classrooms where home economics and computing were taught out of action in January last year. The rebuild cost was around $2.1 million, with the difference being the insurance between the insurance payout and cost of the new building borne against the school's entitlement for future projects. Andy Wood says, Principal Andy Wood says financial effects will continue for several years years with other school refurbishments delayed as a result. The South Island Taekwondo Championships got underway at Stadium Southland on Saturday. Yellow to black belt levels took part in the annual martial arts competition that saw a good crowd support it. Teams travelled from all over the South Island to compete in both Pumse and Karuji fighting. Pumse is a series of patterns containing blocks, strikes and kicks that are performed in unison and focus on skills that standardise taekwondo motions. In the afternoon, Karuji competition was underway. Karuji's focused on precision and timing, forming the basis of points-based scoring in the sparring and fighting section. The Southern Institute of Technology responded to a call for assistance by Film Fiji. The organisation wanted SIT staff to run workshops for high school students competing in the 9th annual Cooler Film Fest Festival. Film tutor Patrick Gillies and SIT production crew member James Wilkinson have just returned from Fiji where they were running workshops covering all aspects of the filmmaking process from scripting right through to post-production editing. The duo held workshops in three different cities with over 200 students attending over three days. The standard, uh, they were very much novices, novice filmmakers, um, so the filmmaking in infrastructure in Fiji is not particularly strong um, and they're not particularly well resourced uh, with equipment. Um, but I was kind of, uh, uh, judging by the, the, the laughter, uh, I, was, I, I got a sense that maybe they were engaged um, and amused by our workshop sessions and, and also judging by the kind of the, the, the furious um, writing of notes and I also kind of gather that um, you know they, they obviously took quite a lot out of it uh, in terms of uh, content so um, uh, so hopefully we'll see that um, translate into into um, impressive uh, films that are made for the Kula Film Festival that are coming up. Um, I did actually um, uh, cover the shooting process in which, in which case I, I took two students out of the class to, or out of the crowd I suppose, to, to be um, um, actors in a, in a kind of a, a mock kind of shooting exercise. 
Uh, but pretty much that was the extent of their um, involvement, just because of the time constraints. But they did get a lot out of it in terms of, um, uh, I mean, also judging by the questions they posed to me, um, and also, I suppose, their answers to my questions, I certainly got a feel that they were taking things on board, and, and actually some of, the, some of the answers they gave were just amazing, you know. So, um, you know, it was great. So I was over in sort of two capacities, um, mainly to document the event for SOT. Um, so I was filming Patrick uh, performing the, wor uh, the workshops and as we travelled and um, a little bit of Fiji as well. But um, And then from the film Fiji aspect, I was also there to help uh, teach students how to operate camera. What was your impression of the students? Do you think they are really keen to get involved in filmmaking in the Pacific? I think, yeah, by the end of the days, definitely. Um, they all seem to start a little bit slow and They, they knew what was involved. Do you think they yeah. knew the magnitude of filmmaking? Uh, no, I don't know that some of them did. Some of them did. There were a few kids that obviously had done a lot of research, um, but the majority, I think, of the workshops were, if they did know, they were sort of too shy to say. Um, and then by the end of it, I could get a sort of a grander sense of the, which kids were sort of onto it and not. But I think I feel by the end of the workshop, they all had a, a good sense of an overview of what filmmaking is in a in a large production scale. Value. You'll be watching with interest then to see what um, comes out of these workshops uh, as far as productions go in, in Fiji. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, the the children, uh, the students, they seemed really. Um, a lot of them were second time entries and so uh, we were able to see their films that they'd made last year so it'll be really great to see this year the, uh, the improvements that I'm sure there'll be. Mozart, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Beethoven were just some of the composers whose notes rang out from young musicians in the city on Friday night. Dozens of young classical musicians performed at Invercargill Repertory playing in the moment to achieve something they couldn't produce on their own. The Chamber Music District contest items represent many hours of hard work for participating young ensembles. It's also New Zealand's longest running youth competition as well as being the only music competition for secondary musicians and composers in the country. 500 groups nationwide from Invercargill to Whangarei perform as part of this year's district contests which are refined to 12 district winners who compete at the national finals taking place in August. And that's all from the news desk this Monday. Sport follows the weather next from the news team. Good night.